on March 18, 1965, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov stepped outside of his Voshkod 3KD spacecraft for a total of 12 minutes and 9 seconds to become the first man to ever walk in space. It was a harrowing mission. Leonov's spacesuit pressurization failed during the walk, and he was nearly unable to return to the spacecraft. Leonov had a cyanide capsule with him, so that actually had been the case. It was perhaps due to this experience, and Leonov's proven ability under pressure then, that he was chosen for another historic first. The Soviet's top-secret mission to the moon called for a similar spacewalk transfer to a Soviet landing vehicle. The Soviets intended for Leonov to be the first man to walk on the moon. Alexei Leonov Alexei Leonov was born in Altai, Siberia, on May 30, 1934. Just two years later, his father was imprisoned as an enemy of the people during a Stalinist purge. Many people disappeared during this period, but his father was not one of them. He was returned to the family after they moved to Kamarovo. Young Leonov would draw or paint and sell his art to assist with the family finances, doing primarily still life and landscape art. His dream was to be an artist, and in fact he was accepted by the Academy of Arts in Riga. He, however, had to decline the offer due to the costs. Instead, he went to a Ukrainian preparatory school for pilots, flying solo for the first time in 1955. He became a fighter pilot at the Chugoyev Higher Air Force Pilot School. He studied art part-time as he continued his formal schooling. He eventually joined the 113th Parachute Aviation Regiment as a lieutenant in Kiev. Voshkod II in 1960, Leonov was chosen as one of 20 Soviet Air Force pilots to partake in cosmonaut training. On March 18, 1965, he left his mark on history as the first human being to exit a spacecraft for extravehicular activity. Taking off on the Voshkod 2 spacecraft, since the Voshkod 1 craft failed, Leonov was elemental to the string of victories that the USSR won during the space race. He would later comment in an interview with the French Federation Aeronautique Internationale that his first reaction to exiting the spacecraft was the absolute affirmation that, quote, the Earth is round. Leonov remained in open space for just over 12 minutes, tethered to the spacecraft by a 16-foot cable. He recalled feeling the intense warmth of the sun on his face, which was not protected by a filter, and was impressed by the absolute silence that reigns in space. Unfortunately for Leonov, not everything was smooth sailing. Once his comrade, Pavel Ivanovich Belyaev, known as Pasha to friends and family, let him know it was time to go back in, the complications started. Leonov described the terrifying realization that took place in an article for Airspace magazine, quote, Our orbit would soon take us away from the sun and into darkness. It was then I realized how deformed my stiff spacesuit had become, owing to the lack of atmospheric pressure. My feet had pulled away from my boots and my fingers from the gloves attached to my sleeves, making it impossible to re-enter the airlock feet first. He had to find a swift solution, and bravely settled on pulling himself into the airlock slowly, head first, the opposite of what the general procedure called for. The only way for the spacesuit to yield and return to a more maneuverable form was to release some of the pressurized oxygen through a valve. This move was extremely risky, as it could have resulted in his death. He took the risk knowing that staying outside also meant certain death in 40 minutes or less. He decided not to report his course of action to ground control in order to keep stress to a minimum and to avoid receiving conflicting or uncertain orders that might put him at more risk. The moment the complications became evident, the spacecraft radio and television transmissions were cut off. As he began depressurizing his suit, he could reportedly feel the heat rising, which required even more physical exertion from him. He was able to curl his body around so the airlock could be closed, and Belyayev turned on the equalizer and pressurizing mechanism. Leonov returned to the spacecraft sweaty and exhausted. The mission continued without any more major bumps until they were due to return to Earth. Their guidance system failed, and they had to conduct a manual re-entry, meaning they had to estimate the landing spot, along with the precise length for which the rocket would be on. They soon realized that landing would have to happen almost a thousand miles to the west of the pre-planned landing site. As leader of the two-man crew, Leonov was in charge of navigating and determining the landing site. He recalled making a choice in his article for Airspace magazine, quote, Our orbit would take us right over Moscow. We could set down in Red Square. But we had to choose somewhere as sparsely populated as possible. I decided on an area close to the city of Perm, just west of the Ural Mountains. We could not run the risk of overshooting so much that we came down in China. Relations with the People's Republic were poor at the time. Belyayev was in charge of orienting the craft, 
and both had to immediately return to their seat positions as soon as they were done dealing with the mechanics, as re-entering required that the center of gravity aboard Voshgod-1 was exact. As they entered Earth, however, the vehicle still entered a spin. The spacecraft fortunately stabilized a hundred kilometers above the ground once the landing module snapped free from a cable connected to the orbital module. They landed in two meters of snow, with no specialized supplies to withstand the temperature of Siberia. When Balyayev asked him how soon he thought the rescue effort would take, Leonov jokingly replied, quote, In three months, maybe they'll find us with dog sleighs. Pilots were soon flying around the area, assessing the situation or delivering supplies. One pilot sent down a bottle of cognac that burst upon hitting the ground, and others provided more helpful items, such as weather-resistant clothes. Complicating the rescue effort was the thick woods all around them. To stay alive, they slept that night huddled together inside the capsule, but the detached exit hatch left a hole that could not be covered. The next morning, a rescue team arrived, including two doctors and a cameraman. They all had to remain at the site, while the forest around them was chopped down for a rescue helicopter to land. Moonwalk The unexpected trials of Voshgod II proved that Leonov was not only an excellent cosmonaut, but one that could act well and calmly under the pressure of complex situations. To Soviet leadership, this signaled that he was the man to send the moon. While the United States publicized its efforts, including success and failures, the USSR's attempt to place a man on the moon were far more discreet. Many details remained under wraps until after the fall of the USSR. The N-1 moon lander the Soviets were designing was more complicated than what NASA was assembling. Leonov himself described the main difference in an interview for the Science Museum, quote, When approaching the moon, I would have to spacewalk from the descent module into the lunar lander. At a set time, the spacecraft and the lunar descent module would separate. I would be the only person on the lunar lander. To train for the daunting task, Leonov participated in exercises using an altered MI-4 helicopter. It would be flown 110 meters up, the engine would be turned off, and then he would have to land the chopper using air-induced autorotation. The theory behind these exercises was that the vertical speed of the helicopter matched what the rate of the lander would be as it descended to the moon. A total of nine of these helicopter landings were conducted by the cosmonaut. Things got rocky for the Soviet space program when the head designer, Sergei Korolev, passed away during an accident in 1966. Without him, the team couldn't get their massive 345-foot-tall M1 rocket to work. Its strange design, featuring many small engines right next to each other, threatened to fail and implode if only one of the engines failed. The first stage had two rings with an added total of 30 rockets. What this meant for the scientists involved was that the M1 needed to be extremely reliable before it was approved for space travel. All four attempted launches failed disastrously. Leonov would later claim that he believed the rocket would have worked if Korolev had lived to continue supervising the project. The death of the Soviet moon landing came with Neil Armstrong's walk on the lunar surface on July 20th, 1969. Leonov would have no other opportunities to go to the moon. This mission was not the only one cancelled by the USSR that Leonov was supposed to fly on. Earlier in his career, Vasily Mishin had tried to blame him for the failure of the rocket for the world's first space station, Salyut 1. Mishin argued that the most likely reason for the rocket failing was that one of Leonov's colored pencils had gotten into the ventilation system. His claim was disproved by the official investigation. The Apollo-Soyuz Test Project Leonov's next venture into space came in 1975, with the surprising development of the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, the very first manned international space mission. With space race tensions easing up after the moon landing, the USSR and United States were more open to collaborating on a space mission that would have once been unimaginable. The plan was for each country to launch their own spacecraft, and then for the astronauts and cosmonauts to unite once they were in orbit. On the Soviet side, Leonov commanded the mission and was accompanied by Valery Nikolaevich Kubasov, traveling aboard the Soyuz 19. The American mission was led by Thomas Stafford in the company of first-timers Vance Brand and Deke Slayton on board an unnumbered Apollo craft. The two spacecraft were linked once in orbit, and Leonov waited in the joint docking module for the astronauts to open the hatch of their spacecraft. Stafford was the first American to shake hands with a Soviet in space. The two space crews exchanged gifts, visited each other, and ate meals together for two days. Both crews learned the other's language, with Leonov later joking they had often spoken Oklahomsky, English with Stafford's Oklahoma accent. The mission served as a sign to the world that the two rival nations were open to cooperation. It eventually resulted in coordinated efforts on the Mir space station, and finally the International Space Station. Honors and Art 
1969, a Soviet army deserter fired at a motorcade carrying Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev in an assassination attempt. Leonov and other cosmonauts were in limousines that were part of the motorcade. Leonov got away unharmed, and the attacker was arrested. Other than that incident, he was able to live a peaceful and celebrated life. The cosmonaut received 21 Soviet honors, eight foreign government ones, and several other private initiative recognitions or awards. He continued his work as an artist, publishing books of his works and collaborations. His art can be found in galleries around the world, with the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow hosting around 200 of his paintings. He consulted on several space-related films. Alexei Leonov combined his passion for visual arts with his profession as a cosmonaut for the rest of his life. Because I want to be a movie star. 